Holiday. And hello and welcome to this 40 days live event. We are glad that you are here. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. Today's gathering is another opportunity to interact during the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. So thank you for joining us today. Today's conversation is with the Reverend Bill Miller on the topic of implicit bias and racism. And I will introduce Bill in just a moment. For those who are following on Zoom or on Facebook, please feel free to use the chat function throughout to ask questions or to make comments. But first, a little background for our conversation today. So the 40 days of engagement is a time that's running from October 12th to November 26th. So we're right in the middle of it right now. Um, there are opportunities for reflection every day with the exception of Sundays. Every day you'll find online um, an opportunity for learning, um, a faith reflection, children's activity, commitment and ideas for advocacy. Today is a time to explore Bill's reflection on implicit bias and racism. So if you go to the website for the 40 days, you'll find Bill's reflection for today, which is day 19. And then on the very bottom under downloads, if you click, you'll open a PDF, which is full of um, activities and ideas, so all of those that I named the resource, the, the learning, the children's activities and more. In addition, as part of the 40 days, each week we are featuring a new book that explores different aspects of anti-racism work. This week, the book is called Haunted Healing, sorry, the book is called Healing Haunted Histories, A Settler Discipleship of Decolonization. Um, this book is a, a wonderful new book for exploration. It's available from the United Church Bookstore. So if you go to the website ucrdstore.ca, you can order that book. For people who are engaging in the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism, if you use the, the discount code 40 days, you would receive a discount of 20% off orders of two or more books anytime from now until November 27th. So the 40 days live event, the books, um, the online activities, these and more are all available uh, as part of the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. As well, today is a pre-event for the, um, the Engage conference, which is running from November 3rd to 7th. Um, and you can also find out more information about that online. It's a free online United Church conference. Um, today's a pre-event. There's also forums for the 40 days that you can engage in that way as well. And we'll post those links in the chat. So we're really glad that you are here today. Without further ado, um, please allow me to introduce Bill, who will lead us in conversation today. So Bill Miller is the host of the podcast series, Open Out, and it's about the nitty gritty of intercultural ministries. This series grew out of research funded by the McGeechee Scholarship and Bill's years of ministry at Knox United Church in Winnipeg. Bill is also part of the Forum for Intercultural Leadership and Learning and the Western Intercultural Ministry Network. So welcome to Bill and over to you. There, I think, we're, can you hear me? Uh, good. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, much of this will be by video. I'm just recovering from a little bit of minor surgery, um, a little bit sleep deprived and not quite clear. Uh, just as we begin, I want to invite you to, <clears throat> if you will, to become aware of the land beneath you, the land on which you walk, on which you live and interact, the land on which you are standing, sitting, is sacred ground, made sacred not only by its creator, but by the love and care of faithful custodians, caretakers, the ancestors. No matter where you are on this, in this land, you are in a covenant relationship, a treaty relationship with the original caretakers and their descendants, the various indigenous nations and peoples. So I invite you in a way that is natural for you to simply think of those who have cared for the local land in which you live and thank them for letting you be there.
treaties, of course, are but one form of covenant. The ancestral peoples, the original caretakers, also lived in relationship with the non-human residents, the animals and the plants. And these too have been caretakers. And they too have bent to allow you space to be here. And as seems natural for you, I invite you to offer your thanks to them. The land on which we walk, the space that we inhabit is sacred indeed. Let's pray. Creator God, we too are called to be caretakers. For that to happen, we have to somehow be able to hear you. But listening is not always easy for us. And so we ask humbly for you to clear the chaos and the clutter that in this moment we can focus on the things that really do matter for the gift of one another for all the differences between us that allow us to grow in gratitude. For grace abundant in this moment, we thank you. Take, we pray, this moment and all our days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Amen. Thank you, Bill, for opening us. And we will continue. Um, uh, with your video presentations. And please um, feel free to ask uh, questions using the chat function. Hi, welcome. My name is Bill Miller. I'm coming to you in video format because um, I have to go in for surgery in a few hours. And there, some of the nice doctors in Winnipeg are going to rearrange my nose somewhat after an accident I had about a year ago. You know, and, you know, it's an interesting thing. I look forward to being on the other side of that so that I can breathe properly. But the actual change process in which that actual moment of moving my nose back over, I'm not looking forward to it very much. Change is kind of like that a lot of the times. That the post-change experience, that's desirable, but change itself it can be a little difficult. That's part of the reason why my day in, in these 40 days is called the day of inaction. It's a time for inaction, but mostly it's a time for inaction. That's where we need to deal with the deep stuff around racism, the deep stuff around ethnocentrism, the deep stuff that gets in the way. If we're to be a reliable ally, then we need to do our work, deep work, in order to prepare ourselves. So I want to start with a few we exercises to involve you in. I didn't invent any of these, so you may be familiar with one or perhaps even all of them. Um, but we'll try anyways. Um, after each of these, I'll give you a few seconds for you to do some thinking. And, and after that, we'll break into groups. The first one is called The Surgeon's Dilemma. A father and his son are involved in a terrible car crash. The man died at the scene. The child was rushed to the hospital in an ambulance, and when the child arrived at the hospital, was rushed into the operating theater, the surgeon pulled away and said, I can't operate on this boy. He's my son. How is that possible? The second one, call it, what's in a name? Now, until the 1970s, and if you're old like me, some of you will remember this, hurricanes were given only female names. But since the mid-70s, the names have alternated between 
male and female names going up the alphabet. So Anna, Bob, Carol, Daryl. Researchers, when they removed catastrophic scale hurricanes, studied death rates in hurricanes with female names compared to those with male names. And they found that the death rates in hurricanes with female names was twice that of those with male names. Why? What's going on? And the third one I've called, what's height got to do with it? As it turns out, I, I, I should offer a, a little rider on this. It's a very sensitive subject to me. I'm, I'm about five, seven and a half, though I always pretend I'm five, eight. Anyways, less than 15% of American males are over six foot. Yet fully 60% of male corporate CEOs are over six foot. Less than 2% I'm sorry, less than 4% of American males are over six foot two. And yet 36% of the male CEOs are. Why? What's going on? Now, through the magic of the wizards who know how to do such things, you will be broken into groups of four or five people. And there you'll have about six or maybe seven minutes to chat. And I invite you during that time to share your ideas about what's happening in each of these three exercises. Now, if you happen to be familiar with any of them and you know the answer, I invite you just to hold back for a bit. Let the others chat. And let them suffer and then offer your idea, your, your answer. And then if as a group you have had a chance to look at what the answers are and, and see what's going on, ask yourself what is going on underneath all of this that could create this kind of stuff, this kind of experience in humans. Enjoy your groups. I hope it goes well. So you all should have received an invitation to join a breakout room. Um, if you don't see one, check behind some other uh, um, windows on your uh, screen and it should be there. Great, so while people are in breakout rooms, um, Bill, there's still some people who are, are viewing us on Facebook Live and just wondered if you wanted to engage some conversation or if there's anything you might want to say uh, for those who are still streaming in different ways. Ah. Um, sure, but uh, I don't know how. Um, and it's kind of like this elusive company of people who are out there, um, Facebook living. Um, uh, so I have no idea if there's any way for them to contact me. Is there any way for them to contact me? Can they contact me through you? They can write in. 
anyone can write in the chat. In the chat. So they can write the in the chat yes. too. So if anybody <laughs> wants to chat that way, um, they can. Uh, by the way, on, on the one about the height of CEOs, one of the pieces of research um, that I find completely unacceptable is that apparently researchers have found no culture in no culture in the world is there a preference for shorter males. I find this to be a complete and utter, uh, that's unacceptable culturally, really. And I think we should start a new culture. Um, anyways, there is a... All good. So there's been no comments coming through just yet. So that's just fine. That's welcome just to just fine. hang out here. And... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I noticed that uh, there's a little delay in the, um, it's a bit like watching, uh, you know, a dubbed movie. And that's fine. It may be the resolution that I was able to send it in. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not the end of the world. Uh, when people are um, watching the videos, are their videos off? Because I, from other things, I noticed that that makes a difference in terms of bandwidth. I think some are off, some are on. Yeah, so we might encourage them to turn their videos off while they're watching it. It might improve that. It's not the end of the world, though, you know. I would like to be able to do that in real life, to be able to have your words come out um, at a different time than your lips are moving. It would be cool. But... So for those who are watching on Facebook Live or watching a video, we're just having some conversation about uh, what, what Bill has been engaging in, in conversation with. So the three scenarios. So if you're watching online, if you're alone, you could do some quiet reflection or write some things down or um, have conversation with people when you see them later on today. Some of these will be familiar to people and, but perhaps not all of them. So Bill, about two minutes to the seven minutes you uh, indicated, uh, do you want to let me know or do you want me to just bring them back? When I, I would just bring them back. And yeah, and I think probably six is, would be, would be fine. I said six or seven, but I think we could, Okay. Um, you know. Because it's sort of a conversation, but it's it's it, this is more a conversation in terms of getting the head thinking, right? You know, it's not a, so much content based as it is to start to engage with that part of our brain. All right, I'll bring them back. takes about 60 seconds for the room to close. And again, if in case you're watching on Facebook Live, uh, people are coming back from small group conversations. Uh, so welcome to do some quiet reflection and we'll continue on in just a moment. <clears throat> Right, so welcome back, everyone. Hope you had good conversations. Um, I, I know that some of you noted that parts of this were challenging. Uh, so please feel free to write, continue to write comments in the chat, and we'll pick those up and Bill, Bill will respond to them. 
Um, but it, and in the meantime, we'll continue on and uh, Bill offer some responses to some of what you've heard. Hi, welcome back. I hope you had enjoyable discussions. Let's look quickly at those exercises. So in this terrible accident, the boy's father was killed and he was rushed to the hospital where the surgeon couldn't operate because she was his mother. Now, the surgeon is the mother, female. Now, I didn't get that when I first looked at this riddle and I was totally embarrassed. I mean, I'm been married for 43 years to a very strong feminist and and I've always considered myself to be an ally and have an open mind and still I didn't get it. Why, I wonder. Now in that second example of hurricanes with female names, well, you might think, you know, well, maybe it's because the meteorological society gives worse names to females. No, it's not it. They're decided years in advance. It's random. The reason is because when people heard that a hurricane with a female name was coming, they didn't prepare. They didn't consider that it would be as dangerous, as violent as one with a male name. They also found that the death rate increased depending on the perceived femininity of the name. So people didn't prepare as much for a Hurricane Tiffany. There's an implicit assumption in our minds a female was something less violent, less dangerous. And the third What's height got to do with it? Well, that's something called height bias. Researchers have found, and I find this to be a dismal finding, that there is no society on earth that has a, shows a, a preference for shorter males. I find that to be unacceptable, but apparently it's true. There seems to be something in the architecture of our brain that associates height with competency, with strength, perhaps as a warrior. Now it's absurd to do that, but these are all forms of what's called implicit or unconscious bias. These are, are patterns in our mind that exist and they don't work through the thinking part of our brain. They happen automatically. It has to do with perception. You see, researchers have found, and I have no idea how they did this, that we are exposed at any given uh, moment to about 11 million pieces of information. And our brains, our, our thinking part, can only deal with 40. So that means we have to whittle everything down, simplify it, and that's where unconscious or implicit bias comes in. Now, let me give you another couple of examples around perception. First, check out these two tables. Are they the same size and shape or different? Are the tabletops the same or are they different? Have a look. Odd, isn't it? What our brains are are doing is they're not perceiving what's right in front of us. They're perceiving what they think they see right in front of us, what they expect to see right in front of us. And that matters. Here's another example. Take a look at these two faces and see if one has a lighter skin tone than the other. These two faces were actually computer generated and they emit the same amount of light. Exactly. Yet in our minds, we tend to perceive the one that looks a little more Caucasian as lighter. 
it has to do with expectation, not with perception, not with what we're seeing. This is all part of the way bias works in our brains. Remember that all that information coming in, and our we have to have shortcuts in order to process this, and we needed it for evolutionary purposes. Um, we need, you see, the thinking part of our brain, the brain, the part of us that that does what we think of as thinking, is the prefrontal cortex. It's kind of up here in this area of the brain. It's very good to have it. It allows us to know that we are thinking, metacognition, those kinds of things. But its computing power is limited, and it's quite slow in its processing, and we need to be able to move quickly. Um, we need to be able to rely on automatic purposes. If every time a child darted in front of your car when you're driving, you had to con um, have a conversation with your prefrontal cortex, now what, I remember, what is it that I should do? What's the rational choice to do when a child is darting in front of my car? Um, oh yes, I should put on the brakes. Well, at that time, it's too late. We have to move immediately. And that grew out of our evolutionary past where if we saw something that we thought was attacking us and we thought it might be, I don't know, a saber-toothed tiger, um, we run or we take our spears or whatever we do. Now, if we happen to find out that it's just a visiting chieftain who's wearing a saber-toothed tiger coat, well, no problem. A false positive is safer than a false negative. And so we needed to be able to move quickly, and that thinking part of our brain doesn't work. Now, much of what underlies racism occurs in these other areas of our brain. That doesn't excuse it. It just means that's where we need to try to work. Trying to work only with the frontal areas of our brain won't help us. If you haven't read much or explored much around the theme of unconscious or implicit bias, I encourage you to Google it. You'll find there's a whole bunch of things that are in there that are quite fascinating. One that doesn't relate in anything to what we're talking about, but it's one of my favorites because it totally explained my experience through the years um, is um, is called what's it called something like time bias um, and what that means is that there's a tendency for humans to underestimate by about half how long it will take them to do a task but to pretty accurately estimate how long it will take somebody else to do it. Well, that's always what happens to me. I'd be saying, oh, I can get that done by, it was in a couple of hours, and like four or five hours later, I was still working on it. Anyways, there's a whole bunch of these. Have a look at them, and, and I think you'll find them very rich for helping that internal process of change that's so essential. You see, bias is universal. We all have them. Throughout all of the world, we have them. The interesting thing is that although they're ubiquitous, that everybody has them, they're quite malleable. They do tend to change quite quickly. As soon as we know about height bias, we're much less likely to follow it. When they become conscious, they tend to lose their power, their strength. Privilege is not ubiquitous. Some people have it. And some people don't. In fact, the only way you can have privilege is if somebody else does it. Now, when bias and privilege come together, then we have problems. It's then that racism can begin to develop, to grow. Um, privilege is the exter external expression of this. Entitlement is the internal way. So we are given privilege by the external world. That creates within us, or can create within us, an internal entitlement. Now you can't change privilege very much. I guess you could, but generally speaking, you know, it's a given. What you do with your privilege, if you have it, that's what matters. If you, here's a few examples. Um, do you often think about your race, what race you are? 
If you don't, well, you probably have privilege. Because most people who experience racial discrimination do think about it. If every time you get stopped by a cop, you don't wonder if he stopped you because of your racial identity, well, you probably have privilege because the experience of others causes them to think, well, maybe he stopped me because I'm black or because I'm indigenous or because I am whatever. You might not be able to change privilege per se, but you can change entitlement. And that's a part of the work. To disentangle yourself from entitlement is one way to begin to disarm this toxic mix that can occur. Now, my approach, like different people are different ways, right? But my approach is I tend to not get very hung up on words. Um, some people um, uh, would use um, racism as a kind of a personal construct. It, it's, it's something that individuals have. They can, they can have a racist attitude towards somebody else. Academics and many progressives um, tend to use it as a, as a structural um, thing. It's about uh, society, it's about having power and, and all of that. Now that tends to be how I use it. So for me, if you are a member of the underclass, if you are a member, of, if you are part of an oppressed minority, um, um, my experience, I was worked in deaf ministry for a long time. You could be deaf and you could have racial prejudice, but you couldn't have racism because you tend to be excluded from power. If you were indigenous, if you are black, um, if you're a member, if you are racialized, that's how I would do it because it links with power. But other people have a more personal um, definition. It doesn't really matter. There's an interesting book. I happen to have it right here. I will be reading it in the waiting room. Although I don't know if I'm if the, holding it up, that will be, um, uh, it will be backwards. I hope not. And it was, it's called Cast, and it's by Isabel Wilkerson. You might have read it. Now, her thesis is, is that she believes that in America, and I would suggest also in Canada, that what we really have is a caste system. And that members who are in the lower caste are, tend to be folk who are racialized. And there is often a hierarchy there. Um, and so you could have that uh, in America, uh, being black is here, being you know, Latino or Latinx is here, and so forth. Uh, uh, in Canada, indigenous, black, up, and, and so, so, but she sees the structure, the mental so structure and the social structure as being similar to a caste system. Interesting to explore. You know, we all, we have the hardwired brain structure that we have, and we have to make the best of it. It's helpful much of the time, but there's a few things to note. One is that that little amygdala, that fight, uh, flight, fight, fear mechanism, it's a little trigger happy. Like it doesn't take much for it to flare up. And as soon as it flare out, flares up, it sends, you know, adrenaline throughout the whole of the body. And we aren't able then. And as soon as that happens, then we can't confront that part of our brain. You know, that the prefrontal cortex goes, oh, okay, I'm shutting my doors. I'm putting up some boards on right now because we're in some sort of danger here. Um, so disarming that fear mechanism is really important. What has helped you disarm fear in the past? Can you think of times that you have gone through some sort of a a change in, 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 in perception. Um, take, for example, um, with the changing demographics uh, in our society, um, I can remember a time when if I went somewhere and I heard people all around me speaking a language that I didn't know or different languages that I didn't know, I would feel some sort of anxiety inside me. That's also a kind of a, a bias, in-group bias and you know, 
series of things. We don't need to go into all of the details here, but I would have a kind of an anxious response. Then after a time of working, I worked at Knox Winnipeg, which is a multi in a, in a very, very culturally diverse neighborhood and is a highly intercultural um, community of faith. I noticed that if I would go to superstore, superstore was a supermarket where I attended in, in that neighborhood, repeatedly, all around you, people would be speaking different languages. And at a certain point I noticed, oh, and I would have a great sense of gratitude within me. Oh, isn't it wonderful to live in this country? So instead, what happened is the, the experience was the same, the, the data was the same, but something had changed inside me. Well, what is it that can equip us to make those kinds of changes? What helps us change? So I'm going to invite you to break into groups. Again, we'll consult the wizards to get them to do that. Uh, and to talk for a few minutes, if you will, about um, implicit bias, unconscious bias. Is that something new for you? And about bias and privilege and entitlement, how they might work together, how you've seen them working together. And then, if you have enough time, also just do some talking about what it is that has helped you change, what has helped you to overcome or reframe a, a perception in order that fear doesn't get in the way for you. Enjoy your conversations. Thank you, Bill. So for those who are watching on Facebook Live, uh, any words of wisdom, people are engaging in small group conversations based on what they've heard. You can use this time for quiet reflection or if you're with someone else, you can talk with them. Uh, anything you might want to share, Bill? Now that I can unmute. Unmute doesn't seem like it should be a word. You know, like mute anyways is probably kind of offensive, but but unmuting seems to like, I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know that I have much um, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of reflection, but there's for anybody to explore this whole area, and there's a whole pile of resources out there. Um, uh, there's a, a number of um, podcasts by The Hidden Brain, where, which is an NPR one, which looks at this uh, field. There's a, there's a whole lot of different resources around in terms of exploring it. And I really am committed to the idea that, that we need to do that internal work before we can actually become effective in our external work. Um, it isn't instead of, it's what allows the external to have strength. Um, because one of the groups that is most, in my experience, most ex um, unaware of implicit bias um, are social progressives. Um, they tend to, we tend to, it's not a they, I'm you know, fully in that class, tend to have a kind of an elevated uh, uh, view of our enlightenment. And that gets in the way of recognizing the simple things that are going on right in front of us. Um, I can remember um, very early uh, being with a group of people and, and one of them was a very articulate, uh, strong social advocate, uh, and the, but was unhappy with the ethnic churches because they, what were called ethnic churches, because they weren't following the rules. Um, and I remember that person saying, you know, uh, we will teach these ethnic churches to follow the rules uh, one way or another. And I can remember saying, do you have any idea how ethnocentric your statement is? These are rules were developed because they work well for Western intelligentsia social progressives. They don't work well in most collectivist cultures or other cultures. The person was offended and but but is uh, such a, because we are areas of blindness 
are implicit. We don't see it. We don't. Um, another small example is um, um, I worked for many years with Amber Kodka, who is uh, from Nepal, um, and we did intercultural worship together. And through all of that time, right, like right through the whole thing until right at the end of my of our working together, I suddenly looked at him and said, Damber, all the time that we've done intercultural worship, we have used the Anglo model and layered upon it Nepali patterns or African patterns or other things, never once using the Nepali pattern uh, uh, or the African pattern and layering on it Anglo things. It was simply a part of, uh, and it's not wrong, our minds do this. Um, the great thing is when they recognize what they're doing, it actually is, they're, they, they're quite changeable. And you suddenly go, oh, uh, and um, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a marvelous thing to have that experience of it being undone. Um, a comment uh, around uh, uh, the cast thing, that, that particular book I, I, I have just, I'm, uh, my reading was interrupted a bit in this, but this is a fascinating, I mean, the, the concept here, concept here is really that um, because caste gets into the, 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 the structural, the way the brain actually structures reality, um, that uh, if we have an implicit caste system, and I think the right that we do, this is what becomes the foundation for so much of uh, racism in our society and how we think. I see people up here joining. Yes, so people are back. So thanks for oh, your, your comments yep. about, about caste uh, and, and some further reflections on the book. I uh, hope you had some good conversations from your small group or for individual reflection and we'll continue on um, with further of Bill's reflections by video. So biases are simply one form of generalization that our brains engage in, mental shortcuts. And that's what stereotypes are. That's why we have them. They actually have an essential function. But when our stereotypes attribute negative qualities to a particular group, then we enter the realm of prejudice. Now, if that group is something we considered to be a race, we're called a race, I mean, race is a funny construct, but anyways, it, if, if that group is a race, then it's racial prejudice. Now add in entitlement, privilege, and power, yeah, you end up with racism. Biases are ubiquitous, it means everyone has them, but not everyone has the same ones. Some, like planning fallacy, and that's the, the proper name and the thing I was trying to remember the name of before. Some, like planning fallacy, are just rather quirky. But others, others are disastrous. They have terrible consequences. In Canada, 30% of the male inmates in our federal prisons are indigenous. And yet, only 5% of the general population is Indigenous. Now, that rate of incarceration is even higher than in the U.S. where Black males are jailed at more than five times the rate of white males. What's going on here? Now, is it because Indigenous folk or African Americans are, are somehow more innately drawn to crime? No, of course not. Or maybe because being economically disadvantaged, they're more likely to be tempted to enter the realm of crime. Well, poverty, unemployment, housing, discrimination, all of these can have an impact for sure, but that can't explain it. And although we do, of course, have racist cops and we likely have racist judges, most of those incarcerated were likely sentenced by 
fair-minded people trying to do what was right. So something else is going on then. But what? Now, when I was doing some research, I found this odd finding. Researchers in the U.S. found that for, in, for male inmates, the darker the skin, the thicker the lips, and the wider the nose, the longer the sentence and the greater the likelihood of receiving the death sentence. When compared to African Americans with lighter skin. That, now that can't sim that simply be racism. I mean, bigots aren't generally that selective or, or perhaps that sophisticated. Something else must be going on to contribute to this great injustice. And it's likely something related to in-group bias, a, a very real and unconscious and generally unconscious form of bias. I suspect that in Canada, at least on the prairies, research would show that the stronger the stereotypical indigenous accent, the longer the sentence. Accent bias is also very real and also generally unconscious. So what do we do with all this? We can't, we mustn't somehow excuse racist attitudes and policies by saying they're just part of being human. Well, remember, biases are ubiquitous, yes, but they're also very malleable. We can change them, we can change our minds. That's what metanoia, the Greek word translated repentance in the New Testament actually means, to change our minds, to change our thinking. Well, okay, so how do we do this? Here's a, a few of what in my research I found to be helpful, per, perhaps even essential in the process of changing. One, desire internal change. Recently in the lectionary, we read the story of Bartimaeus, called blind Bartimaeus. Well, what did Jesus ask him? He said, what is it that you want? And he replied, Rabuni, to see again. That's what he wanted. Well, we have to want to see as well, if we're going to be able to see. And that means being open to changing, even if it perhaps hurts a bit. Second thing is illumination. Recognize a bias for what it is. Oh, I see. <laughs> That's what you are. I was thinking that you're strong. I noticed that you're tall. I see what's going on. And then the third thing is to foster compassionate curiosity or sometimes called compassionate inquiry. Converse with that part of you. The bias or, or, or the fear that you're experiencing. Oh, I see what you're doing. You are trying to protect me to help me. Thank you. But I'm okay now. I won't need you to do that for me now. I'm okay. It sounds bizarre, but it works. It really does help. And in that process, avoid guilting yourself. Avoid self-condemnation. Well, guilt and, and self-condemnation these can be momentarily satisfying because, once again, our egos are getting the attention that they crave. It's just that, in this case, it's negative attention. But ego doesn't care. Positive attention, negative, just be attentive to me. But these processes also are stimulating, and they stimulate the limbic system. And the limbic system, that, that that's the system where the hippocampus and the amygdala and those other parts of our brain operate. And activating them means that we are shutting down our prefrontal cortex part, the thinking part, our reasoning part. And so 
that combination will limit the efficiency, the efficacy of the change process. Now, by the way, when that system is activated, that fear system, that, 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 that part of us where we feel, oh my gosh, what's going on here? I, I, I'm feeling anxious, I don't understand. When you have that kind of an experience, um, uh, there are some steps that you can take that can really help. You feel that impulse of fear or perhaps even resentment or judgment, First thing is slow down. Slowing down allows your limbic brain, that, that the amygdala, the hippocampus, to disarm themselves. Okay, okay, you can let go. And then that can allow your prefrontal cortex to reboot and start up again. You can think. Second, breathe. I know we all need to, if we don't breathe, that's not a good thing, but intentionally breathe. Control your breathing just for a few minutes. I don't exactly know why, but focusing on your breathing can really help in these contexts. And third, simply withhold interpretation. Say, I see stuff that's going on around me. I see what's happening but I don't have enough information yet to know what it means. And allow yourself simply to be in that ambiguous place. Not running from ambiguity, from not understanding, that's a real start to helping us to avoid the kind of mental pathways that lead us into racist attitudes. Racism becomes a structural system once a whole bunch of us get together and kind of allow our collective fears to gel in a certain direction. Undoing them means we have to undo our fears, and part of our fear can be the fear of losing privilege. I'm going to invite you to break into groups again for a few minutes to give you a chance to talk with one another about bias and privilege and entitlement. And, and what we can do with them as Christians, as people of faith, as we seek to take responsibility for what is ours, our thinking, our minds, our attitudes. Take a few moments as the wizards recast you into groups. Um, just a word on groups. Um, it's, a, it's a balance in these episodes. Somebody was saying that the group time is too short. Um, probably is. And how we balance getting information in and, and working with an hour sort of construct. But what we're really intending them to be is not the meal. These are the appetizers. These are just to get you started, to, or get the juices going inside your, your mouth and your brain so that you can have those conversations with people around you in your circles and explore the thoughts further. So that's our thought, and I hope you enjoy your, your conversations, your appetizer round. Thanks, Bill. We continue to be live on Facebook. So I wonder if there's anything you might want to say to those who are following, uh, following along live, even as, as others are in their small group conversations. The link between setting up a caste system in our mind or setting up structures in our mind and um, privilege, entitlement, 
and fear isn't immediate because many of us can't don't recognize our fears um one of the things like you know therapy by the way just generally if you've got a good therapist it helps um but one of the things that happened with me as we were going through therapy is I, I came to recognize that I had anxiety. Well, in the whole of my life, I never knew what anxiety was. I, I didn't know I was feeling anxious. I, some, I would have said, no, I'm not. So learning to recognize fear and, and being able to detect it at an internal level helps us because when our fear kicks in, it's telling us something about the context and what we're going to do. And it will it's what is wanting us to go to a different pattern of response where we can simplify and make these things um, all fit. So being able to identify fear as the genesis, anxiety as the genesis is such an important part. If thinking our way out of it would work, that would be great because, you know, to be honest, it would be a lot less work. We could just read a few things and have more knowledge and then we would be able to function differently but it doesn't get at the fear. So learning somehow to focus in on that is key in order for us to become reliable allies without dealing with those inner processes. Um, it becomes very difficult for us to be something that you can count on. So that's a piece of where I see the internal work as being really important. That's great, Bill. Thank you. And we invite people to continue at maybe perhaps with a few moments of quiet reflection um, while others are in small group conversation. You know, just as people are coming, starting to make their way coming back. One of the other pieces is the information on the rate of, uh, of uh, incarceration for Indigenous males in Canada, particularly uh, Indigenous people, but particularly Indigenous males, being higher, a, a greater percentage than incarceration of African Americans is really an astonishing finding. It is not something that gets heralded a lot. Um, and really, I think there's an important piece of work to be done here in terms of looking at what's going on. How is this, what's happening in this context? Um, it was a big surprise for me um, as I was doing some of that research, um, because it's pretty easy to kind of uh, villainize America. Much more difficult to look at the stuff inside us. Welcome back. We hope you had some good conversations in your small groups. Um, we are almost at the end of our time together. I'm just going to post two links in the chat. Uh, one is for the full, uh, if you're in interested in the full content around the 40 days of engagement around anti-racism, including Bill's written reflection about today. You can access that from the um, webpage that's posted in the chat. And as well, this uh, today's 
uh, live event as well as previous live events are all being recorded and they're available on the United Church's YouTube page. So you're welcome to visit that page and maybe give it a couple of days for it to appear. Um, and you can also view um, past recordings there as well. So we're thankful for you being here today. Um, Bill is going to give us one more closing reflection and then um, we'll stick around for another couple minutes in case there are additional questions that people might want to pose in the chat. Um, but here are some closing thoughts on implicit bias and racism. I hope you found your conversations helpful. If you wish to access some additional information around this theme, you could check out episodes eight and nine of Open Out. That's the podcast series that I host, a podcast series that grew out of research funded by the United Church Foundation through its McGeechee Scholarship. You should be able to access these wherever you get your podcasts from. Uh, just search for Open Out or, or perhaps Open Out Intercultural. And Adele, thanks for covering for me, doing the background hosting for this event. Blessings on your journey, folks. It is a wondrous world out there, and we are God's always beloved and ever clumsy friends, upheld by hands far stronger and far more tender than we can comprehend. So at this point, we offer a, a warm thank you to Bill uh, for leading us in this time today, engaging us in conversation about implicit bias and racism. We're very thankful for your insights um, and everything you've had to share both in video and live here today. Um, we'll stay, we'll bring this to a formal close. Again, uh, this, this will be posted online if people would like to view it again later. Um, and Bill, any, if you would like to offer any closing thoughts or if people have a few questions, we can stick around for a few more minutes to respond to those. So thanks again to Bill and for everyone for being here today. Um, I'm, I'm glad to stick around for a few minutes. Um, and I just, I simply encourage people to, um, uh, to access. There's a whole, there's just so much information out there. Um, and it really, as we start to absorb it, it does something inside. So I really encourage you to, uh, uh, to explore some of that stuff. I hope it works well for you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. If, if you're able to respond, there's a question about wondering if you could say a little bit more about compassionate curiosity. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things, because we're, we're, we're attuned to guilt and to um, self-condemnation kind of attitudes, which again stimulates uh, stimulates us is a, is a stimulant and and it feels kind of good in a bad way. Um, compassionate curiosity, any any compassionate inquiry is is simply a process of being compassionate towards ourselves. Once we start to identify, um, we can have all kinds of things inside us that we want to label as dysfunctional, but once we ask their function, oh, what is it that you're doing here? Oh, okay, because generally, except for I think the odd um, narcissistic sociopath, most of us have intentions that are good. And most of the stuff that's going on inside us isn't because we're wanting to be discriminatory or bad or something like that. It's because it's, it's, it's trying to protect us from something. So the process of being of, of, of being compassionate in our approach. Um, there's also a whole lot of information around about, about change and the role of compassionate inquiry in change and starting to look at this, um, where we can have um, uh, self-compassion is, is a really critical part, not to excuse um, racism or anything like that, but to empower us to be able to actually address it. Uh, and so, uh, so those curiosity, just those open-ended questions, you know, oh, okay, what is, how is this working? What's going on here? You know, including in our own inner dialogue. 
Wonderful. And maybe a, a, a last comment, uh, wondering if you might be able to see or read, if you can requote again about perceiving what we can expect and what we can grasp, if you have that with you. Uh, I, I, I don't. Um, um, and I have, you know, I'm old, I can hardly remember what I said a second ago. But the, the reality is that, uh, and we see this all the time, if you haven't uh, Google, um, the uh, bicycle awareness uh, bicycle awareness test, something like that uh, in the UK. There is a whole series of things which is about, uh, and there's, you'll see a little video, uh, and, um, uh, and it's worth exploring. What we see isn't what's out there because we can't possibly do it. Our eyes, our optic nerves have a role of, of reducing the amount of stimulation that we have. So what we see is what mostly what we expect to see. This is why proofreading is so difficult. Um, and you sometimes people do weird things like reading upside down, stuff like that, because our brain is, is in order to make it easier for us to cope. And for this little part of our brain, somebody compared it to dial up. Um, it's very slow. And so it always is looking for shortcuts. So what the eyes perceive or think they perceive is not the same as what's really there. And th so there are, again, internal processes to allow us to see what is right in front of us. Um, I think that the, the question to Bartimaeus is really interesting. What is it that you want? And his response was so intimate. The same word that uh, Mary Magdalene used, Rabuni to see again and, and really that um, understanding that what we see is not what is there is an important part. There's also this links to quantum and a whole bunch of other things, but it's a part of being able to re-understand how perception works within us. Um, and that allows us to, um, um, to have a different view of ourselves and our context and of our uh, capacity to create change. I think that's an excellent note to end on. So thank you very much, Bill, for your time again today in person and on video. And we wish you healing, healing uh, blessings on your healing journey. And again, thanks everyone for being here today. And um, the recording will be available online as well. So thank you all. Thank you.